How are you feeling? I'm good. Uh, just a second. And uh, fine. Uh, welcome to the Africa for Palestine webinar series, Reverend Sir. Uh, welcome to the audience, viewers at home, workplaces in different parts of the world. My name is Ali Komabi. I will be hosting this webinar series. Today, our guest is uh, Reverend Seth Neka, and uh, he will be discussing with us um, morality, ethics, and opposing Israel. Um, those who are not familiar with our work, uh, I think it's important to introduce what we do. Uh, we are Africa for Palestine. We are a human rights organization that is primarily with Palestinian human rights in the African continent. Our offices are based in South Africa, but we do our work largely in the continent. We work with several society organizations that um, do the same work and agree with the cause of Palestinians, um, your churches, your religious organization, mosques, uh, your temples, and so on, uh, trade union movements, political parties, student movements, and the largest civil society organizations across the continent. Um, our, our task also is to push back the influence of Israel in the African continent and to restore um, Africa's unwavering solidarity with Palestine. We have had this webinar series for four months, if not five, uh, in running. And uh, we have had different people from different walks of life talking about different things academia, activism, um, religion, and so on, on, on Palestine and many, many other issues. Today we have uh, Reverend Seth, who will be, like I said, speaking to us about um, ethics, morality, and opposing Israel. Um, welcome to the webinar series, Reverend Seth. Yes, uh, thank you. I hope that uh, we are streaming uh, together well, and good to be with you, Ali and uh, your listeners in this webinar series. Um, my name is Seth Nyker and I work in Johannesburg South and I, I work in a ministry called Via Christi Community Church, as well as uh, in a ministry called Church Out of the Box. So it's, uh, yeah, it's an honor to be with you all. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, and just to clarify, you know, like, uh, Africa for Palestine and in the resistance to Israel. I think one of my opening remarks is to be clear that uh, the politics of, of, of Israel must be clarified from the people and, and uh, the people that are inhabiting the land. Like political Israel has to be clarified. So, so even as you hear opposing Israel, you know, I know for many Christians this will be alarming, but hopefully in the conversation, uh, especially those of you that are coming from Christian faith, we can have a conversation about it and open up, hopefully, uh, a courageous conversation of sorts. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Reverend uh, Seth. And of course, uh, you just give us a brief, uh, a brief uh, bio of himself. Um, just in, in, in two and three minutes, just for our audience uh, and our listeners, just, just tell, tell us who Reverend Seth Necker is, just in three or two minutes. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm an African of Indian heritage and ancestry, uh, South African of residency, and, uh, you know, so born and raised in, in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, and then uh, for more of my years in Johannesburg. So I shouldn't say raised in KwaZulu, but more born in KwaZulu Natal and raised for many of my years in Joburg South. So areas like Lanesia, if you know Lens and Lens South, that has been a lot of the, the time I, I spent uh, growing up. Uh, a son to my, to my father, David and uh, Joyce. And today I can say, well, I'm a dad of four children and uh, married to um, an awesome friend and partner in work and in ministry, Marisha. Um, yes, and I work between church spaces and youth development and educational spaces as well. So I can say a bit about that if, if that's what you want me to, Ali. 
Uh, but just to say, I'm passionate. I've, I'm passionate about issues of reconciliation and justice. I've had the awesome journey to learn from some beautiful friends around the world. Um, we've lived in the States for five years in a place called St. Paul, Minneapolis. And currently I'm in LA. So not Los Angeles, but uh, as people would call it, Lower Alberton. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that, Reverend. Let's, let's get into it now. Um, we know for a fact that um, there has been and there was in the South African case, and particularly in other cases like in the United States during slavery, that oppression was morally and ethically justified. Um, we know that in South Africa, this was done through the Dutch Reformed Church, where the faith, the Christian faith, uh, was used to justify, and I can argue legitimize apartheid. We've seen it in the United States, and you spent some time there during slavery, where um, the church and ministers and leaders of the church would justify slavery, would justify subjugation. Um, so to, to the layman, um, just, just, just walk us through how that is done. How, how can the Christian faith and Christian leaders justify this kind of oppression? And, and just walk us also through your own experience and through your own knowledge, how did that trajectory change in South Africa? Yeah, so firstly, I mean, you, you named the, the, the Dutch Reformed Church. <clears throat> and I think it's important that in my own learning and understanding that when we think of apartheid uh, as a system of, of governance, um, but also a system of, of organized evil, social evil, social disruption. <laughs> it was a constructed evil that, that, uh, that said to you, you would be a certain human being and you would be lesser of a human being. Uh, but not only was apartheid endorsed by a political ideology, we've learned from history and no one's going to deny it today that the church, uh, and unfortunately, the DRC, the Reformed Church, the Dutch Reformed Church, had a part to play in, in this reality of, if you like, affirming, providing a theology of understanding, you know, separate human development. Um, and so, it's, it's a hard one because if I say to you, I carry for myself a faith today that I, I have to work out, how does one understand your Christian faith? How do you understand Jesus in this context? How do you understand you know, your religion? But remember that anyone can take religious documents and then start to pick at it into different spaces and places and construct for themselves uh, a way of being, a way of understanding. And so those of us that may pay attention to like the colonial project, well, yeah, the church has had to own up to, you know, uh, colonization, to slavery. And, and I, uh, for one, Ali, as a person who is of Christian faith, don't want to enter into conversation denying this. I think what, what makes it a, a great conversation is to embrace it and then embrace how the church connects with productivity and profit making how, how a church can be co-opted, you know, for large times, and it's important to understand that before you even think, think about the Dutch reform church, uh, you know, if you think upon, as, as I've had to learn in, in biblical and theological studies, the early day church was a church of martyrdom. So for your faith, you died for your faith. Suddenly around about the time of uh, AD uh, 333 there, I think about when a person Constantinople comes into play, and he makes the church part of the power. He puts the cross on the, on the armory of the, of the empire. And in that moment, we see the connection between church and politics and state. And so, so, so in some way, the, the Dutch reformed church and what happened in South Africa is quite young in the, in the, if I can call it the eternity of the colonial project, the enslavement project, the empirical project. Um, however, it's also important to say that there are those, uh, and I'll quote one name amongst many, like um, who's, who's also part of the reform faith, Alan Busak, also comes out of a, a reform church, associated reform church called the, the Uniting Reform Church of Southern Africa, which uh, I'm a part of through my service of Via Christi Community Church. 
uh, and the Uniting Reformed Church also did amazing work to deconstruct this pseudo theology, to deconstruct this theology that, that uh, affirmed and supported the heresy of Parte. Uh, Busak writes in a book, Black and Reformed. Uh, and in some ways, like we would speak of, you know, James Cone in the United States, people have come have become accustomed to talking about Busak in this light. Now we might have, you know, different understandings of Busak over time, but he set in motion an understanding of theology that allowed black people, persons of color, people that were not supported by an apartheid regime to begin to claim their faith in who? In Jesus Christ. Uh, and so in that way, quite ironically, while people might say, how can you be a Christian? Because that's what it will translate into. And I, I mean, can you imagine if I landed and said, well, which Jesus are we talking about? Are we talking about the Jesus of empire? Are we talking about the Jesus of apartheid? Or are we talking about Jesus, the black African Jesus of liberation? The black African Jesus that wants to bring our freedom. I mean, and that's been a, that's a that's a great conversation to have. So, in my understanding now today, as I serve the church, that's how I've begun to to deconstruct a a, a faulty theology. Uh, and I hope in some way that uh, that gives you some inroads to how I understand my faith today. Uh, Ali, thanks for that. Yes, yes, I'm with you. Um, uh, I, I just wanted you to, to, to maybe delve a, a little bit about the South African project and, and how, how that was, was really changed. You spoke about Busek, we know about Desmond Tutu, um, we know about other Afrikaners um, of the Dutch Reform Church who, who stood up against apartheid, the Kairos document, and who said, you know, apartheid is anti-Christian, apartheid is against the Christian values, Christian norms, and so on. Um, but to, to be more specific also, um, and this is not perhaps not only for, for South Africa and Israel and Palestine, but in other societies where they experience oppression, um, that how do, how do ministers, how do church leaders um, uh, relate to activism? How, how do we say, uh, how do we relate them to activism? You know, we, we've known that men of the cloth are, are caring, you know, ministers are loving, but, but how do we relate them to activism? Yeah, I think, you know, that's where, that's where faith, faith, faith uh, calls on us to be courageous. Um, and we have, uh, while I'm here today, I'm, I'm also in some ways a connected to the, to, the, to the journey of faith that has been connected. Like you, you mentioned some Africans. So if we took, you know, um, Bayes Nordia and uh, Stellenbosch University still has a center, the Bayes Nordia Center, named in his name for making a stand uh, to challenge the apartheid regime. But in my learning of um, Bayes, the minister that was the former minister of the church that I'm currently working at, Harry Lubber, was also one uh, year a white male Africana who came to understand that his faith called him to, to be critical of empire, to be critical of injustice. And so when you ask the, uh, the question, how do ministers understand activism? You know, some people don't understand activism, you know, because it depends on what kind of faith you swallow. Like, uh, you know, we can be talking about Christianity today, but if I, if I, if I, and I say swallow because it's like a pearl, it's almost like you were in the matrix, you know, choose it red or blue, red or blue. Uh, and it depends on what you, if you swallow the red pill, you might end up being like a Trumpian, you know, if you swallow the blue, you know, you might end up being more like Obama and his crew. But, but, but again, it's, it's, it's this, it's, it's this reality of life that I become uh, who I hang around with. So fortunately for me, you know, part of my own shaping within my, within my spirituality was not only by ministers, because some of the ministers that I was around growing up, we're not, we're not all so clued up about activism. They might have wanted to do activism around like, let's, let's uh, toy toy for, uh, for the cleanup of our tennis courts in Lanesia South where I grew up, right? But they wouldn't want us to toy toy uh, around, you know, um, uh, schools that were not inclusive and were only for Indians. And those schools were only for persons of color, or as we'd say in South Africa, colored people, or those schools that are only for blacks. So it's a very interesting thing, even in activism, how do you consider activism? I mean, today I could be telling you like Diwali just, just 
went by in the weekend, right? Uh, and for those of us that don't know about Diwali, others will call it Dipawali. For those that are, are Tamilian and Hindu people in our country, they celebrated uh, in some way, one will call it their, their, first, their festive religious holiday. Uh, but in the area that I'm living in LA, some people are losing their minds. They are more committed to activism for animals and the rights of animals because they're hearing crackers. So even when we talk about how do you understand activism, I hope my point is coming across clearly. It depends on who you hanging, who you are hanging around. Because if you're calling me to love the earth and love animals and so on, there needs to be a connection between environmentalism and justice for human dignity and equality. How is it? I could never understand growing up, you know, people would want to talk about, you know, love the earth, but you hated the black man. You know, clean up the parks and give us beautiful air. And, you know, don't let the dog poo poo here in that garden, but you can't, you can't care for the rights of a, of, a, of a human being that is identified as a black South African. I mean, globally, this could be said the same, you know. So, so I think when you ask me the question, Seth, how is it that that ministers then understand activism. It depends what I'm being activistic about. Some people that are in the church serving as ministers would be all activistic around, you know, the prosperity gospel. Let me tell you, bring me your money and I'll give you that blessing. I mean, and, and that's, that's the kind of shape that has been endorsed. So now they're very activistic because there's a charge, there's a drive. So I wanna, I wanna clarify that when we talk about activism around this issue, for me, Micah 6 8 comes to mind. I talk about activism of social justice, not uh, social uh, bamboozling. You know, we, we, we must clarify activism about equality, not an equality that is about, oh, well, some are going to be, you know, equal, but there are some who are more equal than others. Then let's add another language in there. Let's say, no, it's not just about equality, it's about equitability and access. Now, Micah 6 8 would say to me, uh, out of the prophetic tradition of the, of the prophets of the Bible, say to me, hey, you know what God requires of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Now, that's the same Bible that the DRC back in the day, and let's also, you know, give them some, some kind of grace because they later on, you know, uh, clarified that they, that, they, that they see apartheid as an heresy. The same with, with other churches as well. The Salvation Army did so as well, to go to... Uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and own up. I think they were one of the only church bodies in South Africa to do so. But when I clarify it like that, I got to see activism from a social justice point of view. Uh, it means that I want a place for equality of, of people. I'm looking around, uh, you know, access to resource. Um, and, and so you, you kind of have to make a, a decision here. You know, will you be about the rights of all people or are you a hater? Now, I also have to say that you know, while, while, I, while I've come from a, from a justice background, and I didn't learn a lot of this in the church, but I must thank God for my, for my mom and my dad that educated me through politics. I must thank God uh, for, my, for my leaders in, in, in Indonesia, like, uh, you know, if I can remember Ismail Vadi. Uh, he, yes, he's a Muslim of another religion, but he took time to meet with students like us, to, to educate us. I must thank God for my teacher. I name him today just to honor him, but Nitz Palani. Uh, I, I have the honor today to work at a church. Can you imagine inside our school while I'm studying geography, while I couldn't hear about it in the church, Nitz Palani would close the doors and even the curtains to say settlement geography became a topic of political awareness. Now that happened to me. I lived through it. Uh, you know, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing it today. I don't think the, uh, you know, the, the government will mind it today. But back in the day, if it was told, he possibly would have been locked up. Now, those were educators. I'm grateful, though, that a person like Nitz Palani was also a Christian. He showed me, like, listen, there's some other angle to your faith. Your faith is about the pursuit of human dignity. Your faith is about equality. This Jesus is not some hedged, uh, you know, hegemonic white, uh, you know, construct of a Christ, an empirical construct of a Christ. This Jesus is about justice. And I mean, you know, in that way, that's, that's kind of informed my understanding of how we today, of how I today understand myself as a minister. Now, look, I can't talk for other ministers, but I hope you got the point. Which pearl are those ministers swallowing? Because if they're swallowing a wrong, a wrong pearl on religion and faith, then they become a product of, their, of the construct that they are in.
Uh, yeah, thanks for that. And, and, and uh, we know this from our history of apartheid that um, the church existed in society. So the church was part of society before it was a church. Um, so people who went to church were oppressed. People who went to church uh, were oppressors as well. So um, uh, thank you for that. Um, moving, moving to, 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 to Christianity, uh, the church and uh, activism, um, would you say um, that there's a moral and ethical problem with the current state of Israel at the particular moment? Yeah, so yeah, I want to take a moment which is which I think is important because when we have these conversations, and especially if there are people that are, you know, they would call themselves Bible believing Christians. Uh, I've heard some people use the terminology, I'm a born again. Uh, and I want to say to people, like I, I went and spoke with another colleague of mine uh, from, you know, the, the, the Kairos uh, uh, movement here in South Africa. This is obviously the Kairos that is linked to the document at, uh, at, at some Johannesburg City conference. And right at that place, I am a Christian. So I want to declare firstly, even as I enter into the space, Ali, I'm a Christian. I am not a, a wandering you know, open to, to yes, I'm, 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 I'm exploring, I, I explore a great diversity of, of traditions. I've studied, you know, religion, I've studied uh, diversity and inclusion, but I would be lying to you if I don't declare to people that are listening today that I am a Christian. I've been, I've been, I've had my toes baptized in great, beautiful Baptist songs because my family on one side has a Baptist background and I'd sing great songs like go tell it on the mountain over the hill and everywhere and then on the other side you know my dad comes from a more pentecostal charismatic tradition some of them will call them happy clappies so my journey of life towards faith is really baptized in the christian experience however when we start to talk about topics like this on israel right especially in the political design of the state of israel and, and, and Africa for Palestine. There are many Christians who blindly will say, if I speak a word against Israel, God is gonna curse me. Okay, why? Because this is written in our text. You will read through the Psalms, you know, I'll lift up my eyes to the hills and all of that. But then it says that God will not let Israel. And when, you, when, when people see that word in the text, which obviously now we've inherited from from, uh, from uh, Hebrew and then via Latin. And now we put it into our Bibles in the NIV or the Good News Bible in an English translation. When people see that, they see that as the Israel of today. And so I wanna clarify, if there are some people who are Christian today who don't like corruption and they have an issue with the Zuma years and even today with the African National Congress and it's corruption this and corruption that and look at the state, well, open our eyes. That's the same kind of political Israel like we have here in South Africa. They are political Israel. They are making money. They are doing their thing. Uh, and you know, it, it's important to understand that, that a, pol a political Israel is possibly not even the same Israel that we're talking about in the text of the, of the Holy Bible. And, and this is obviously for me uh, as, as a Christian, it's important. Uh, and, and, and when we talk about, you know, is this Israel having a moral and having an ethics. Let me start where I can speak from. I, I'll, I'll look at our own government. People will say, how can you support that government? I mean, this is our government. We still have a platform of, of a unity government where you vote in your people, so-called democracy that by and large, you know, IEC maintains, not like what we are watching there now uh, in, in the state, people questioning the results. By and large, the IEC, our electoral, electoral commission in South Africa has vetted our processes. Uh, but when we look at our, at, our, at our government, I also have to say, while I might be one that was coached by and persuaded by, I can also have a critical voice about the political management of our state. I think that becomes important for Christian leaders. When you read in your Bible of, the, of Israel and you read about the places, that, that some of those places are crossing even in the geography of the land, Palestine today. And this is what it is. Like when we think about Jesus, Jesus was born in what today is what we know as Palestine. Now, 
it might have not been said back then, but it's a reality now. Only thing that places have changed, you know, names have, have, have changed. I mean, like we got to get real about this issue. Like you can call, you can call Joburg South, you know, Soweto and make it all fancy. But some of the reality of what Soweto was in the party, it still remains Soweto today in the democracy. So when we go into that, into that language, is there something morally wrong with Israel? Is there an ethical uh, concern? Yes, I believe the political Israel is dominating in its politics, but then also in a way hoodwinking the religious leaders. They, 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 can you imagine a, 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 a rabbi that will, that will stand up and, and thank God that there are those rabbis of Jewish faith that have made a stand to, to kind of stand out and speak out for justice. So when, when, I, when, I, when I lay it out like this, Ali, in the conversation, that's been an important clarification for me as a minister of the gospel to understand the politics of Israel and Palestine. I mean, I'm not a specialist on it, but in my learning and in my journey with organizations like Kairos and in my journey with some mentors like Nora Kami, who's been over to South Africa at Kairos 30, and in my journey with reading of people like Alan Busak and Frank Chikani, we kind of get a voice. And those of us that, that have become you know, aware of Christianness, don't demonize those Christians. Sorry to use a word like demonize because we want to make it demonic. Soon as you speak about Israel, anti-Israel, you're going to tell me that guy can't be a Christian. I am a Christian. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I am safe, sanctified, and set free. I'm a hallelujah kind of Christian in the pulpit as well. But I've clarified, and I've said this to one of my mentors, even when we are preaching, sometimes when I read the text, uh, and this has been helpful for me in, in the readings of some of the writings of Dr. P uh, uh, um, uh, Curtis Paul DeYoung. He talks about reading it in that time that when we engage the people, engage the people as Hebrew people, people of a language versus people of a state or of a land. And when we can talk like that, I can say, well, who are these people? These are God's people. And when I do that in, in some contestation, when people only want to hear Israel as the Israel that of the Bible is the Israel of today, I can say that God is speaking to God's people for this time. So yes, uh, with, that, with that explanation, I believe that political Israel in its journey and the, and the management of its state and how it's oppressing people that are coming out in the, in the space of Palestine uh, is irregular, it's untoward, it's immoral, and it does take a sobering of their politics to kind of open their heart. It's almost like here, yeah, if we reflect on South Africa, you need someone to come, come not that we want to praise, you know, um, our, our former president of the National Party. Luca, uh, he slips my, my, my mind right now. Uh, please. Yeah, President De Klerk. Sorry, Mr. De Klerk out there. But it took someone to kind of wake up to, to a conversation to know that, he, that we couldn't continue like that in South Africa. Now, I don't know, you know, whether, whether they're, whether their prime, prime minister is even at that place. Uh, possibly the president, uh, Reuven, can, can wake up because in June, there was a killing of a, of, a, of a child, of a Palestinian child who was thought to be a terrorist, just like we had Nathaniel Julius die here in, in El Dorado Park uh, by police, military kind of style and tactics. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I wonder in, in that politics, have we had a conversation with the president? You know, because Netanyahu seems to be dominating in the atmosphere. Um, but yeah, just to say that there's something wrong when we are occupying land, making people walk in modern day, you know, the holy land through prison walls. Uh, and this I've heard by accounts of my friends. I myself have not had the experience to travel this yet, but I've actually journeyed with people who have been and seen the irregular dominance of land and occupation of land that makes Palestinian people's life a, a, a misery. Thank you for that, uh, Reverend. And uh, and this this takes me to my to my second question. As you've said, um, one of the things and you please, do. Ali, really if I may ask, by way of conversation, if I'm talking too long to get to my point, you must just say, "Seth, get to the point." And I hope in my in my story sharing. <laughs> no, we're fine. As far as, far as I'm concerned, we're fine. We're fine. Are we fine? Are we doing okay? Are we fine? For the listeners we're fine. out there, I mean, because I'm checking, some of them are online. Are we doing okay? <laughs> Uh, you know, please put in your voice because me, I'm a storyteller and I'm going to bring it like I know it. Uh, um, so, so like you, you, you were saying that when you read the text, you read it in a, in a, in a certain way that uh, 
does not, um, uh, let's say, confuse the political Israel with the spiritual Israel in the Bible. Uh, what do you think is the responsibility of, of Christian leaders on the Palestinian question, given, I can give you an example that there are many, and this is not, this is not unique to South Africa, it's happening all over the world. A lot of Christian leaders will go on pilgrimage to Israel for this or that reason, and in which Palestinians, Palestinian Christians have welcomed, say, many Christians all over the world come to pilgrimage in Palestine, um, in Bethlehem, where you say Jesus was, was born, in Bethlehem is in Palestine. Many of them would come back with stories of revival and so on, and would not talk about the occupation, would not talk about the the military state that they see when you get to the airport in Tel Aviv, where you, you can see the soldiers, you can see the Israeli forces. When you walk in Palestine, you can see the checkpoints, you can see the humiliation of Palestinians every day. But ministers will go and come back and just tell a story of faith and not what's happening in Palestine. And we know this even in South Africa, if you remember very well, said they would have these trips where you visit, they make they take people from overseas, they come, they go to Kruger, they visit the um, Kruger National Park, they go to Soweto in the developed townships and they tell them, look, South Africa is great, Not let, don't let nobody tell you about apartheid. And they don't, they don't show them what's happening on the roads, they don't show them the townships of Alexander, the scams and the slums that apartheid has created. So what, what becomes the responsibility of Christian leaders on the question of Palestine, given that Number one, we are aware of what's going on in Palestine. Number two, we know what's going, what's, what's happening to Palestinian Christians, the shrinking numbers in Pal of Palestinian Christians. What becomes the responsibility of, of, of said a minister and a Christian leader? Yeah, I guess, you know, as a person, I can, I can speak as a person, because again, remember, as we represent church bodies and so on, um, even church has politics. Uh, I, I could be speaking here today and somebody could hear me and then walk away and say, how could he, how could he dare go and speak for Africa, for Palestine? And tomorrow they close your networks in your circle. So I just wanna say, let me, let me step into my, my personal space. As a minister in a very conservative reform church, I took every year without fail for six years to commemorate the June 16th uh, happenings, to educate our children, to educate our adults, every year without fail. Uh, at first, you know, it was just a kind of trickling, just a few people came. But as people woke up to the, that, that my wife and I, Marisha, were leading a, a visit, a kind of a educational visit to, to uh, the Hector Peterson Museum. Now, that's not really revolutionary, because if you went around there today, it's quite nice, you know, uh, where's this place we used to eat, like a chow there. Um, Marisha would have to be, be with me now to, to tell me the name. Uh, but, but, you know, it, it's been created like a touristic site. But can you imagine us making, being insistent, a calendar kind of year that says we go to the place to commemorate June 16th to, to establish what we can do for our young people, but also connect it with the political history of our country and choose never to forget what happened in our land, what happened on June 16th, 1976, and even before that June, you know, in 1974, when there were uprisings, uh, uh, so, so as we think upon it, I think like that was my call as, as a person to keep education around justice issues. And then we reflect for the whole month of, of youth month on young people and emerging leaders, but not doing so of just having a lack of vibe and not connecting to our, our historical context. So when we think upon, you know, uh, the, the, the Palestinian question as it relates to the church, Firstly, I think it is education. Like what I just said to you, there might be great academics who've written theses and PhDs. You, we, we need to establish and be aware, Ali, that in South Africa, by and large, the Christian world has, has a broad understanding that our connection is to the holy land of Israel. It's kind of stitched in in our studies, unless one is on a journey of theological understanding and learning that requires critical thinking. Or if you've been in the mentorship of justice activists who now are reading scripture with a contextual lens. And what do I mean there? Like someone would say, well, you've got to read the Bible and take it everything like it is. But I mean, if you're doing the work of exegesis and you know of, of, of doing our work as theologians and Bible 
uh, study students, we are always asked what's happening behind the text or before the text, what's happening in the text, why is it happening in the text, and then what should be our application in front of the text. But sometimes if you're going to read everything literally as, and that's been governing, but on top of it is a cloud and a great cloud of, of gloominess that kind of wants to keep the, the viewpoint of Christian people dominated by this cloud that almost allows you to blindly say, if I am a Christian, I must support Israel. Now, so when you ask the question, what do we do with the question of Palestine with, uh, as Christians? How do we address that? Well, like when you say to me, Seth, there are groups going over to, to Israel before COVID-19, obviously now, and with, with Israel possibly going into another lockdown. Can you imagine they go to places, even on a, on a, on a, on a pamphlet for, for the land, the Holy Land, where they are in Palestine, they won't tell people they're in Palestine. I mean, you know this, you've been there, right? So, so, so these are kind of the hoodwinking that happens. And it's not far for us, it's not a far stretch for us to believe that this can take place. But can you imagine if I go in a bubble, eating, like I said earlier, if you followed my lingo, uh, I took the red pill, right, Ali? And now in the red pill, I'm in that bubble and I'm, I'm flowing in that bubble. Now I go to a place and I see this horrendous stuff and I ask a question, and in a matter of moment, there's a facilitator that says, oh no, you know, this is the way that the, the Israel government is trying to protect its people from Hamas. I mean, that's been the lingo. Every time you hear about Palestine, you hear about terrorism. Somebody's got to stand up and speak the truth. That no, every time uh, uh, people are dying is not just linked to terrorism. It's got to do with an irregular state of Israel that is uh, using its power irregularly to dominate people. I mean, uh, yeah, people thought it to be revolutionary. Come on, expose the Christian world to Christians in Palestine. That's what we did, right? I mean, I remember 2016 working with um, uh, Mr. Desai and they gave me, you know, uh, the, the stones cry out as a, as a, as a, as a, as a movie. And we, we were gonna use it for, you know, the uh, Israeli apartheid week in March. And I approached some people to say, let's watch this movie together. Let's have a conversation about it together. And, and, and why I put, put that out to, to you to just say was the, the, even from, and I won't mention institutions, from places of theological uh, awareness. When I said, let's get students just to watch the movie. Can you imagine there was a kickback? A kickback of total silence. Not great idea. Hey, Seth, come on by, let's have the conversation. And I just said, let's watch the movie. And what we thought it to be was what a great awareness to say, well, there's Christians in Palestine. Now we need to think broader. We need to speak about the Christians in Palestine, but if Christians are only gonna respond for the rights of, of humanity and dignity for the Christians, that would be irregular according to justice. The Jesus that I serve doesn't want me to only acknowledge the rights of Palestinians only because of Christians. There are Arab people living there. There possibly could be Jewish people living there. The whosoever, there could even be some people that have returned from Ethiopia, heading back to the land, you know, uh, as the 12th tribe of the nations of Israel that might have ended up in that space. And if they're there, then my pursuit of justice should be all encompassing. So, so when we speak about what do we do, I think we gotta, we gotta get people more aware and we gotta break it down from the academic circles to actually explore this with people in, in their theological learning, not only in Bible colleges, but having conversations around it. And then what must be important? I said to you, Ali, that when I attended Kairos 30, for many of our black African brothers and sisters on the continent, you want me to worry about Palestine? Here I am dying here in my own country, okay? So then we gotta be sharp. How do we connect Palestine as a global landing point toward justice? Because this is another issue, race, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the establishment of race, when you over lighter you and you rock up here, I mean, some of my Palestinian brothers and sisters know what I'm talking about when they come here. They come into this country, they are revolutionary fighters for their own Palestine, then they come here and the society that they're able to relate with better are lighter you people. They can't even connect to black African brothers and sisters of a darker you. Now, maybe someone has not reflected on this, but I wanna say this openly. We've gotta make a connection to Palestine, no matter of the shade of the people and connect it to the black plight of our people in this land. And that's, that's a conversation that we're not having. We're not having. And I also wanna to say to activists here in our own country, South Africa, 
if you want to fight for Palestine, then I also want to hear you on the issues to bring brothers and sisters who are Christians in our country, who are of a darker you, that they must hear you with the same tenacity to fight for Palestine. Because if you are busy fighting for Palestine and you can't talk about the black plight of the marginalized in our own country, people are going to say, hey, man, go sleep. How you want me to fight for them in Palestine? But now you see, when I turn this in, oh, and I love this, when I get, when I get to the text, and if I can bring like a Luke 4, uh, Ali, have I, have I spoken too much or you still feeling my, I thought by now I'll get a hallelujah, man. Or I'll get an amen. <laughs> I'm with get you a, come on, come on, preach now. Hallelujah. You know? hallelujah. I I <laughs> so like if I, took a, if I took a text, Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 20, where Jesus, connecting it to the, the book of Isaiah, Jesus speaks about, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, can you imagine I say to black brothers and sisters, that Jesus that we're talking about, that freedom fighting Jesus, that black African Asian Jesus is the Jesus that was born in Palestine. Ha! Now you better wake up to the connection. Now we don't, hear, we don't hear people talking about that, about that year in South Africa. People don't want to touch that year. In fact, and I think this is the disconnect. People that are coming into our land must dip their toes into the black plight of our people. And when those people can feel that I'm with them, with my solidarity, with my ideology, with my connection, then I can tell you, brother, Africa for Palestine can become a reality when ministers here can say, hey, that Jesus that we are serving, that Jesus that we have inherited is actually born in that land. That fight for Jesus and Jesus's people is connected to our fight. I mean, wow, come on now, tell me, tell me that we need to find some other, other ways to have the conversation. Um, th thanks, thanks for that, Reverend. I think. Uh, Do was, I get a hallelujah? Did I get an amen? Of course, you got. I give you two hallelujahs and two amens. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was Nelson Mandela in 1997 who said, "You know, our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of Palestinians." Uh, it was Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. who said, um, "Injustice is uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere." So our struggles are contested. Are contested. Um, you know, today is Palestinians, tomorrow is us, the next day is Asian. So our struggles are connected. Uh, lastly, lastly, Reverend, as, as, as we wrap this up, uh, uh, to, to Palestinians who follow us and to Palestinians who support our work, um, are there any lessons they can draw from South Africa's apartheid struggle, especially from the faith perspective and the Christian perspective is the, is this, is the, are the lessons they can take um, and bring it to their own, um, uh, their own struggle. So because I've been following since, you know, Kairos study and my work at Kairos study, where I facilitated some of the inter-religious uh, electives, there, there is a sincere connection between our Kairos document. And for those of us that are listening out there that haven't even looked up the document, check it out. It's a historic document. It's a document where Christian people, so one, one, like today, Ali, we could talk about the DRC and leave it at there and say, oh, look at these Christians. They supported apartheid. Well, I want to talk about the other Christians, you know, the ones that didn't swallow that pill, but swallowed the justice pill. They were Christians and people of other religion that connected around the Kairos document, which was a prophetic document that challenged the apartheid regime. I want to say my own hallelujah all by myself. There were people that kind of saw, amen, faith can't be like this. This Jesus that, that we serve cannot be about injustice. This Jesus that we serve cannot be about apartheid. So this document became a prophetic critique of the apartheid regime and state religion and called us not to the prophetic of the prophecies today. Like, let's clarify, because in Christian tradition, people say, Oh, look at the prophets. But the prophets are those prophets that are saying, eat the grass. The prophets are those prophets that are on the run for the money. I'm talking about the prophetic tradition of justice, the prophetic tradition of challenging status quo, the prophetic tradition of saying to you, if you are, are telling me that this Jesus that I serve allows me as a person of power to lord myself over other people, mm -hmm. then Jesus will say to us, hey, hey watch out. Are you doing what I'm requiring? So, so as I as I return to 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 wrapping up, what can what can what can Palestinian people journey with us? We must be self-critical of ourselves. Like the Kairos document, in the same way 
that it was mobilized as a prophetic document in that time was made illegal. But then it got written in and, and, and in some way I must say, Palestinian revolutionary fighters should pay attention to the fact that we acquired political freedom without economic freedom. We made trade-offs in our own economy that allows, allowed a sunset clause, which I don't see people talking a lot about. You know that there was certain trade-offs made for the economic comfort of the powers that be. I mean, even, even uh, recently when I, when I watched some of the transitions of our country, imagine a marketing agency was busy negotiating how to document the, the, the national party and make them into the new national party so that they could be you know, made much more sober for the election. They were allowed. I mean, these were the criminals that, that hurt people in the party regime, but then they became a formal legal party to run for the, for the, for the democracy, for the dawn of the democracy. And marketing companies were part of it. So come on, I mean, like Israel-Palestine, don't be too romantic about South Africa and even our Kairos document because our Kairos document has to, has to be critiqued further. It didn't deal with male patriarchy in the church. And I mean, one of our sisters that has now uh, passed on, uh, uh, a former uh, uh, moderator of the URC uh, SA, uh, our dear sister, Dr. Mary Ann van Kleikis, uh, she would have spoken you know, uh, loudly about this topic, about patriarchy. We left patriarchy intact even after the Kairos document. So, so how, can we, how, can we, how can we become aware of a much more inclusive society? And I think in that way, when I, when I was speaking to you by the bow to this, like even Palestinians that come here and I've had a conversation and I don't mean to be you know, overly um, disruptive in this, but I do mean to disrupt it. If a Palestinian comes here to South Africa and they cannot connect with the blackest of the black people, when I talk about that, I'm not talking about just the you, but if they find that they can only sit in our tea and coffee shops enjoying you know revolutionary dance there and having a coffee shop vibe but they can't hang out without drug banging gangsters and so on there's a disconnect in the in the social relations why am i saying that because even if i was afforded the opportunity to be in palestine i'll be looking in social mapping where's my santon where's my alex where's my alex that is not formal built uh, buildings but is actually you know, some, some just thrown together arrangements. And what is important about that, that the people of Palestine become aware, how do we fight a revolutionary fight for true equality, for equitability, for access for all? Otherwise, can you imagine after, after a long fight like we've seen in our, con in our country, we come to the end of the fight and we say, how? Oh. <laughs> the trade-off was, well, you know, we'll fight for freedom, but some black elites uh, who have access to political power will have a better access in the democracy. Whereas the large majority of 25 million people there about in our country will live on less than a thousand rand a month. Isn't that ridiculous? But that's what, that's what the freedom struggle ended up. Now, I don't want to be dis uh, the, you know, dissing of, of the fight for, for, for freedom that was made by our political parties, by our political leaders. But like that's something sobering that I think Palestine can reflect on. How do they acquire in their own context their political freedom and the economic freedom, ensuring that we, they don't make the same mistakes that we have made? Because to over-romanticize our democracy is a fault, a real sincere fault. So yeah, I close with these words, Micah 6, 8. Uh, it's a call upon us to act justly, to love mercy and walk humbly with God. So hopefully today as I've Put forward some of my thoughts. I hope they are received well. If you're offended in any way, uh, it's not my intention, but please let's have a conversation. Let's open up a dialogue. Uh, thank you, Ali. Um, thank you, Reverend Seth, for, for such an insightful and insightful conversation. Um, this video is going to remain in the video step on our Facebook page, and we're going to upload the segment of this video on YouTube as well. Um, Africa for Palestine is the YouTube channel. Um, you can leave your comments in the comments section. How's this Africa um, for Palestine? Africa for life. Africa for life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great, great, Reverend Seth. You can leave your comment in the comments section. Uh, Reverend Seth is on Twitter at Rev Seth Naker. Just one word, or you can just search Seth Naker on Twitter. He will come up, pose your question. There is also on Facebook, very active. 
Seth Naker, you will find him there as well, pose your questions there. Um, he is more than willing to take your personal questions as well, if you have burning questions. Um, thank you very much, Reverend uh, uh, Seth. We look forward to working with you on many other campaigns and projects. And uh, we hope to see you on another webinar series we'll have in the near future. Uh, thank you and have a good night. Ali, thank you for your time. All the best with your work. And thank you for the opportunity. Can I, can I close in a word of prayer? Is that okay? It's okay. Lord, thank you today for the work that we do. Thank you that in my own journey, I've come to know the person, work, and teachings of Jesus Christ as our servant savior. May we dig deeper into understanding Jesus, experiencing Jesus, not through the eyes of empire, colonialism, injustice. Let us experience Jesus through the eyes of justice. Let us experience Jesus through the eyes of equitability and access. Help us, Lord, to conquer the systems that break down and marginalize people. Uh, bless the work that my colleagues are doing uh, in, in Africa for Palestine, but around our own country and around the world. Let justice become our, our, our year and now fight. Uh, and even when we become discouraged and weighed down, help us to remember that uh, you are with us that you keep us centered and you keep us focused in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, see you, everybody, on Thursday. Uh, thank you again, Reverend Seth, and have a good night. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.